ますので。<笑>
the management for Turkey of this uh, uh, border was uh, a challenge, but of course uh, the challenge changed uh, during the last years, uh, during the last decade. And uh, well, even uh, very, very recently, because we have the war uh, in Ukraine that changed the deal, but also, uh, you know, because uh, we face this uh, terrible quake uh, some uh, days last week ago. And uh, well, I can confess that I was a bit like British says, just to say between the devil and the deep blue sea, how to uh, present uh, my presentation this morning. Uh, so uh, finally, I choose uh, not to uh, uh, change completely my, uh, my presentation, but of course, I will have some uh, development uh, on the situation uh, with the, the, the recent quick. Well, just to introduce my uh, presentation, well, today, uh, 12 years after the Arab Spring, uh, Turkey is sheltering more than 4 million of uh, refugees from, Syrac, from Syria and Iraq. And, um, well, as the crisis in these two countries are not definitively solved, uh, Turkey has to manage uh, its neighborhood with two unstable uh, states, Iraq and Syria. But since uh, 2016, especially uh, regional and global strategy of Turkey has deeply changed too. Uh, Turkey has adopted a more uh, pragmatic uh, position, getting closer from Russia while maintaining unequal relations uh, with its Western allies, uh, the EU countries and uh, the US. And this, uh, you have to know that this borderland uh, issue, especially the issues of refugees, are uh, currently at the heart of the, uh, of the election campaign debate. Well, despite the fact that probably the quake also has uh, changed uh, the situation, could change the situation regarding uh, the, the, the elections. And uh, well, the, of course, the overall uh, geopolitical context, as I said, of the region is shaken by both the war in Ukraine and the more recently, uh, the February uh, 6th uh, earthquake. Well, this is uh, the Syrian-Iraqi uh, uh, border of Turkey. And just a word about uh, this border, uh, it's a more thousand kilometer border. You see the, the distance here and the main, uh, here the main uh, treaties, uh, while this border is mainly a result of the First World War uh, for Syria and for um, uh, Iraq. Uh, well, the exception is, of course, what uh, Turks used to call the Hatay. Um, this is the Sanjak of Iskanderun that was given to uh, Turkey by France after a referendum in uh, 1939, just before uh, the Second World War. It's important to mention regarding, because I won't go uh, in the detail, uh, to mention here the Vilayet of Mosul. Uh, there is a great frustration of uh, Turkey regarding uh, this border between uh, Turkey and Iraq, and especially the Vilayet of Mosul, because uh, contrary to the, the other lands, in fact, this uh, vilayet was not really conquered by the Allies uh, after the First World War. And always one of the dream of Turkey, I've personally seen that during the Gulf War, is to regain, in fact, uh, this uh, territory. So there is a long story uh, of the border between, uh, a long contemporary story of the border between uh, Turkey and Iraq. 
Well, let's speak of the main player of uh, the Turkish southern border uh, of uh, uh, of the Turkish uh, southern border. Well, on the western part, uh, mainly uh, you have the Syrian regime at the moment, the Syrian opposition, especially the Syrian interim government, that to say the, mod the, the, the moderate opposition, the Syrian salvation government, that's non-Daesh uh, jihadist, and uh, of course, uh, Russia and Iran, mm -hmm. and also the allies of Iran, but to say the Hezbollah. In the central and oriental part uh, of uh, Turkey-Syrian uh, border, uh, we have mainly the Syrian uh, regime uh, and the Kurdish, the Syrian Kurds, with uh, these uh, their organizations, especially the YP, uh, gay YPG, uh, which are the, the militia, the Kurdish militia, and uh, the US are still a special troop in these 600 special troops in this zone, and also France at the moment has uh, 250 special troops in his zone, supporting uh, Kurds in his zone. And uh, on the Turkey-Iraqi borders, uh, you have, of course, mainly uh, the government, the KRG, that to say the Kurdistan government, uh, regional uh, government. Uh, of course, the, uh, the Iraqi regime of Baghdad tried to, to stay in the zone, despite it is mainly a Kurdish zone. And last but not the least, in the mountain of Kandil, the extreme uh, eastern part of this border, the PKK, that you say the Kurdistan Worker Party, uh, it is the shelter of the PKK, the common place of the, the PKK, which is a guerrilla organization uh, launching uh, while well, maintaining guerrilla in our southeastern part of Turkey. These are the, the main actors at the moment. Well, looking at my development uh, quickly, uh, well, uh, on this border, uh, Turkey has faced three major challenges, a neighborhood challenge. Uh, while both states have a, a lack of existence, what kind of relationship does Turkey have with uh, the different actors of the conflict. A Kurdish challenge, how to manage the rise of the Kurds uh, from outside and inside. And an international challenge, what are the consequences of the Turkey's uh, Syrian-Iraqi policy for its relations with major players, the United States, Russia, Iran, moreover, in the new context uh, created by the war in Ukraine and, of course, created by the uh, by the, the quake. Well, first uh, about the neighborhood challenge, well, relation with uh, the Syrian and Iraqi regime, uh, well, since uh, the, the beginning of the, the, the Arab Spring, not before, because the, the relation were improved before the Arab Spring, but uh, since the beginning of the Arab Spring, well, not exactly the beginning, but some word after the months after the, the beginning of the Arab Spring, uh, well, relations with the Syrian regime are, are difficult, but these relations are changing, especially since the Ukraine war, and especially since the last summer 2022, uh, well, the new contact were established between Turkey and the Syrian regime, and perhaps we'll see what are the result of the quake. Perhaps the, the, the relation will improve with, uh, with the quake we don't know at the moment. Uh, with Baghdad, with the Iraqi regime and the current prime minister in, in Baghdad, uh, well, since now, 2007, that's to say before the Arab Spring, the relations are disturbed by the excellent relation between Ankara and Erbil, that's to say between uh, Turkey and the, the KRG. Uh, well, of course, and we mentioned that uh, during the last uh, workshop, 
uh, you had this uh, referendum in 2017 that um, harmed the relation between Ankara and Erbil. But finally, uh, uh, since uh, 2019, the relation has been uh, 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 restored uh, and are still today uh, excellent. Relation with Syrian oppositions of course, you have relation with the Syrian interim government, that to say the moderate opposition. Uh, well, this Syrian opposition is per excellence the actor that Turkey uh, support and would like to, to see triumph, but it's not the case. Well, it will be difficult. It's not the case. So I, I will pass um, because uh, so difficult relation with Syrian opposition. Uh, well, good relation with this moderate opposition, more complex uh, relation uh, with the jihadist opposition who can be bad. Uh, relation with, uh, with Kurds and how to manage the Kurdish empowerment and its consequences. Well, this is the, the situation in, uh, in, uh, in Turkey. This is the, the situation of the the Kurds uh, inhabited the area in Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Uh, well, we can say that uh, we have a cooperation with uh, a huge cooperation between uh, Turkey and uh, the Kurds in Iraq. You have some proof of this cooperation. I was recently uh, in Erbil and we asked to one of the leader of the Pesmerga uh, what was the relation with these different actors. And they told us that uh, one of the, the best relation were, were with Turkey and the worst relation were with the PKK. And so it, it is sometimes difficult to understand from outside. But this good relation established between Turkey and, uh, and the Kurds in Iraq uh, is not, uh, is, is not is, we, we cannot observe this kind of relation with Syrian Kurds. Uh, with Syrian Kurds, we have tensions and war, and especially tension before uh, 2016, and tension since, uh, and war since 2016, because uh, Turkey launched uh, since 2016 three military intervention in northern Iraq. Uh, you see this uh, intervention, and especially because there are huge relation, uh, close relation for different re uh, reason, not only political reason. I, I can be back on this point uh, between the Syrian Kurds and the the, the Turkish Kurds. And that's why uh, relation uh, between uh, Syrian Kurds and uh, Turkey are conflictual relation. You see here the different the three intervention in Afrin uh, on the western uh, bank of uh, Efrat and the last one in uh, 2009. And at the moment, this is the, the different uh, situation changing at the moment, you see the situation. It's a perfect illustration of in between uh, areas that uh, theoretically uh, Daniel developed uh, yesterday. At the moment, Turkey claimed to launch, you see, uh, Turkish intervention and uh, the territory is controlled by Turkey here. And Turkey claimed to launch a new intervention on the Eastern Bank uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, of a threat uh, at the moment. So, uh, well, you see this uh, complex border here with the Syrian regime here, the, the, uh, uh, the enclave of uh, Idlib, uh, here Afrin, the intervention in 2018, here the intervention in 2016, the intervention in 2019. Uh, well, at the moment, the region is uh, held by both the Syrian regime and uh, the Kurds. Here you have uh, the, uh, the KRG and here the PKK, uh, with a very strategic reason also here between both countries. 
Uh, and one of the objectives, in fact, of Turkey at the moment, looking at this border, is to stop the well, the way, uh, the nightmare for Turkey here since the beginning is to have uh, a, a, a border with the uh, with the PKK and its ally. Well, uh, to hand with the international challenge. I will be, uh, of course, I have to accelerate uh, my uh, presentation. Well, uh, look at this picture. Um, uh, when looking at uh, the external actors of the, of the, the region, we can say that the theoretical adversaries cooperate. That's to see. Turkey, a member of NATO, is cooper has cooperation in the frame of the Astana process uh, with Iran and, uh, and uh, uh, Russia. Uh, the paradox uh, is that on the border, official allies, and especially NATO allies, disagree. Uh, this is uh, the, the paradox. Uh, that uh, borderland uh, and borderland issue uh, bring uh, Turkey closer from adversaries as finally uh, it uh, uh, create trouble between allies and especially uh, between, uh, between uh, the US and Turkey and France and Turkey due uh, especially to different issues. I mentioned them here, but also mainly due uh, to the, the Kurdish issue. Uh, well, at the moment, uh, well, these different um, actors agree. Uh, you see here uh, the prime Swedish prime minister with Mr. Erdogan. You know that uh, Sweden and Finland um, apply uh, for NATO membership, and that Turkey at the moment is blocking their candidacy, and especially the, the candidacy of Sweden. And the well link, in fact, to this uh, opposition of Turkey, you have the Kurdish uh, issue, and the fact that, uh, of, of course, uh, Sweden is uh, uh, sheltering uh, Kurdish organization. And Turkey recently, I already mentioned, declared his intention to military intervene again in Syria or in the Eastern Bank of a threat. Of course, uh, for the first time and for the time being, we observe that the United States and Russia agree uh, for once to oppose uh, the Turkish plan of intervention. So this will be my conclusion, uh, Daniel, if I have... Uh, the time to uh, do my, my conclusion. I think that uh, but the Turkish policy after the Arab Spring can be analyzed uh, above all as a strategy to aim at regaining uh, control of its border. Uh, well, by establishing various relations we have seen and sometimes paradoxical relations uh, with the many regional and international actors who are on its Syrian and Iraqi border by military intervention, and also, not, last but not the least, by building uh, walls, uh, which aim in particular to prevent uh, migration and infiltration. And Turkey is also building a wall on the Iranian border, with the, the following presentation with uh, Joanna Aulier will address this, uh, uh, this time, this team. And uh, sometime uh, Turkish official mentioned that uh, their intention is to continue uh, the war to, uh, until the, to, in, to the, the Black Sea. Huh. Some words just to hand with this problem of border with the the quake, uh, and this will be really my last, very last conclusion. Uh, well, so at the moment, uh, of course, this earthquake is special because it hit a geographically wide area, including a large part of southeastern uh, Turkey and northern uh, Syria. 
And this area corresponds to the Turkish Syrian borderland that we have mentioned in this presentation. So what will be the effect of the earthquake and its consequences? Uh, well, on the, the Turkish Syrian border, we can already observe that the relief uh, and international aid have not been similar on both sides of the border, but the Turkish border has been open to let uh, the first convoys of uh, international aid uh, to Syria uh, pass. Uh, here, it is not on the Syrian border, it is paradoxically on the Turkish-Armenian uh, border, because after the quake, for the first time since the beginning of the existence of the Armenian independent state, in fact, a uh, track uh, across the border uh, in the, this uh, close, on this close border, uh, the Armenian and Turkish border. So is it the beginning of a new deal on borders uh, for uh, Turkey? We will see what's happening in the next days and the next months. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean, um, for your presentation. And now I think we are going to uh, have uh, Joanna uh, Ollier. Uh, uh, she's online with us. Uh, and uh, uh, we will have a chance to ask questions. And I, su I suggest, yeah, I suggest that we, we take question after the, I mean, the, the entire uh, uh, presentation. Uh, uh, otherwise, it's. Uh, uh, I've seen yesterday in another panel that it can be slightly out of control. <laughs> so I mean, it's uh, so. Please take note of uh, of your uh, 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 your questions. Uh, Joanna, are you okay? So yeah. I... Can you hear me correctly? Yes, that's absolutely fine. I leave you the floor. Okay. Twenty minutes. Okay. So uh, I guess you can also see my screen correctly. Absolutely. Okay, super. Uh, so thank you for uh, ABS, to, for the organization of these big conferences. And thank you to Daniel Mayer and Richard Schofield for the organization of this panel on borderland in the Middle East. And yeah, also in between spaces in the Middle East. Um, I will focus my presentation on the border between Turkey and Iran which is a very old border negotiated between the Safavid and the Ottoman empires over four centuries. So, and uh, maybe this border is also less visible than other borders that Turkey shares with, uh, for example, with Greece or with uh, Syria. Um, of course, I realize also uh, that my topic might appear a bit trivial uh, regarding the dramatic damages caused by the earthquake in Turkey. So as Jean-Marc, I didn't change uh, my, uh, the, the initial topic, but I would like to take this occasion to, to send all my compassion to Turkish people in this hard time. So my thesis focuses on security issues on the Turkish-Iranian border. And in this context, I encompass economic security in this borderland area. And um, also as it is very difficult to conduct field work in the Iranian side of the border, my research is only focused on the Turkish side of the border. And uh, I am trying to understand what security means in this borderland. So to do so, part of my research consists in questioning the use of the border from a local perspective. And at the same time, I'm questioning the link between border and security. And by conducting my fieldwork, I realized that tourism uh, is actually an interesting topic uh, regarding this link between border and security. And security uh, because indeed I observe the importance of Iranian tourism 
especially for the city of Van. So today I will um, I will uh, focus my presentation on the Iranian tourism in Van and its impact on local economy and after open a reflection about what is understood as border economic security in this borderland area. Um, maybe I have to specify that uh, the border measure more than um, around 500 kilometers, but it is a high mountainous area and there is no big city very near to the border. There is no twin city, there is only villages. Uh, therefore, we might consider that Van belongs to the borderland uh, area, but there is 181 um, kilometers from Van uh, to the border gate of Capico. So that means you have to count almost three hours by car uh, to go from the city center of Van to the border. Uh, so for this presentation, I will first describe, describe uh, the motivation of Iranian tourists to come to Van, then focus on the Turkish perspective regarding this uh, flows of tourism. And finally, I will uh, offer concluding remarks regarding border security and economic security. And so this communication is based on fieldwork uh, conducted between uh, uh, 2021 and last year, uh, where I had the, the opportunity to interview different uh, people, different actors from the tourism sectors in the city of Van and also in the city of Dou Beyazet, which is located uh, in the northern part of the Turkish border. So um, there is a, a higher interest for Iranian uh, tourists for the city of Van over the last past years. Uh, for example, last year, more than 1.7 million uh, passenger pa passed through the capital gate. Uh, and this amount, the step of the 1 million period was reached also uh, for the first time in 2019, after the modernization of the Capicoy Gate that you can see uh, on the map. So I, in Van, I interviewed uh, an Iranian woman, uh, which, uh, which is living in Van and working as an organizer for um, uh, a tourist organization, like she's organizing tour for Iranian people who are coming in Van. And she told me that usually Iranian like to go to Istanbul or Antalya, but for, uh, for six, seven years, more and more Iranian are interested in spend vacation in Van. So they come with their families and children and they pass directly the, through the border gate of Capicoy instead of going to uh, the Bazargan and Gulbulak border gate in the northern part, uh, as she showed me with this uh, drawing. And um, this, this, in, this uh, we can also um, observe an increase of Iranian tourist uh, flows after the pandemics because this border gate, the Kabika uh, border gate was closed from the 24th of March, 2020 and reopen the 9th of October 2021. So how to explain the disinterest uh, of the Iranian tourists for the city of Van? It might be first more simple for them to, uh, to come to Van compared to Istanbul or Antalya. It's less far away. There is the possibility to travel directly by car which means that they are more flexible and they are not dependent of a tour guide, for example. It's also uh, much, much cheaper than Western Turkey, which is an important point in the period of economic crisis. And um, also the economic crisis in Turkey means uh, that for Iranian, it is uh, cheaper and uh, more interesting to spend uh, time on the other side of the border. Regarding time period, Iranian tourists are visiting Van usually during summer or vacation time, 
especially during the Nowruz uh, holiday, because Iranians have certain days of vacation at this time, but also during national days, for example, the 5th of June. And the aim of those uh, Iranian tourists in Van is uh, entertainment. And we can mention also the freedom that women in particular can enjoy on the other side of the border. And the other uh, main goal uh, of this uh, journey in Van is shopping. So they usually buy a lot of makeup and a lot of clothes uh, because apparently Turkish clothes are considered uh, better quality. So it might be for their own consumption or to resell it after uh, in Iran. Um, as I said earlier, I also conducted fieldwork in Doğu Beyazit, but as shopping is the best activity for Iranian tourists, they prefer one to, uh, than Doğu Beyazit because over there, there is very few shops uh, except in a bazaar, but there is no place, for example, to go out at, at night. So the touristic sector in Doğu Beyazit is more related to mountain sport uh, because there is the Ararat Mount which is the highest mountain in Turkey, but it doesn't fit the purpose of Iranian vacationers. Um, regarding the Turkish uh, perspective, uh, there is in Van an overall intent to develop tourism in the city by highlighting the asset of the city, for example, the museum of the ancient civilization who were uh, in this area, uh, to emphasize the good weather, the tranquility, the famous breakfast in Van, or uh, symbolic, uh, symbolic aspect of the city, such as the famous Van cat with one blue eye and the other, and one green eye. But there is also, special public policy to attract Iranian tourists uh, in particular. One can, for example, uh, notice adaptation from business owner. Many shopkeepers invite employ people speaking Farsi. I went uh, to a hotel to conduct an interview called Hadi Hotel. And when I enter uh, the lobby, I can see directly a big flag, uh, the, a big Iranian flag. And when I asked the receptionist uh, about for my interview, she told me that she was Iranian herself. So clearly, the, this hotel was made for Iranian tourists. And uh, the, the owner is also the director of the board chair of the Van Hotel Owners and he contributes to promote the Iranian tourism in Van in general, with the argument that it will benefit not only to hotel owners, but also to restaurants, to shops, and to the whole local economy. And another example of um, special uh, elements to attract uh, Iranian in Van is nightclub, because there is a, a development of club in van but the it's not always possible to enter if you are not iranian so they organize party especially for iranian the most uh, the most striking example might be the van shopping festival organized by the the municipality with the Chamber of uh, Commerce, the board chair of the Van Hotel owner, etc. And it is organized during Nowruz to encourage Iranian tourists to come to Van uh, with, uh, with organization of special events such as concerts or exhibition for Iranian tourists. This fest, uh, this festival is, occurs uh, at least since 2014, but it was stopped for two years because of the pandemics. And I went, uh, I went there for the, the festival last year. So there was a great uh, enthusiasm in 2022 for the, the revival of this uh, festival. And as you can see uh, with those pictures, 
the city was really configured so that Iranian can shop and consume as much as possible. And you can see the sticker uh, where uh, all the stickers were stuck on every uh, shop window. So this fest lasts during 15 days, uh, namely as long as the Iranian holidays. And officially, it aims at promoting the historical and cultural assets of the city to create a brand value and to revitalize the, the local market. There is the willingness also to emphasize a, a sort of win-win situation between uh, the Iranian tourists and uh, the local economy. <laughs> What is interesting to observe is it's also the consequences on the border. Because in order to facilitate this festival, border arrangements were made to enable Iranian tourists to come easily. Uh, for example, the, the, the previous governor of Van declared before the festival, uh, we made promotion about this festival in Iran and talked to the authorities we discussed with the Iranian authorities the measures to be taken at both Ralda and Kapika border gates so that more people can come to Van. And also at uh, this time, more flights were organized between Tehran and Van. So there, there was a movement of opening the border to uh, favor tourism. But at the same time, there is also a willingness from, uh, from regional and national authorities to better curb uh, illegal flows such as smuggled goods. So, um, I wanted to question this win-win situation and to um, make remarks regarding economic security and border security. First remark is that security is considered as important for business and for tourism. For, for example, according to the head of the, the hotel I mentioned earlier, uh, he said for tourism, security is uh, extremely important. At the moment, security in our city is at high level. And in the, in the same ID, the head of another hotel declared uh, years ago in 2016 that security is the biggest problem that hinder tourism potential of Van. And at that time, there was a, a stagnation of tourism compared to a large increase in 2013-2014, which is directly related to the Kurdish question. And as uh, it was mentioned before by jean marc uh, it is related also to the policy between the, the governmental authority, the Turkish authorities and the, the PKK. <laughs> Sorry. So according to the management of the border, this uh, security in the borderlands is ensured by a higher degree of militarization in the borderland and the building of a wall uh, since 2017. The wall officially is uh, settled to curb uh, terrorism, illegal migration and smuggling activities, which is, uh, let's say, common uh, officially reason to uh, for authorities to build a wall, but in this context of the Turkish-Iranian border, it is also directly uh, related to the guerrilla with the PKK. And um, what, um, so yeah, another point uh, which was blatant during my field work is that people I ask question to were unanimous regarding the hard impact of the economic crisis in the region and the structural uh, lack of job and infrastructure. So the reinforcement of the border securitization, especially with the building of a wall, 
also provokes paradoxically a higher degree of economic insecurity, <laughs> especially taking into account the importance of smuggling and informal economy for local people before the building of this wall. So it appears that for a decade, it is more and more difficult to pass some products on the other side of the border, such as fuel, for example. And from this perspective, the, the wall is en ending a sort of golden age of smuggling, where people usually bring back all sorts of products, such as tea, sugar, cigarettes, uh, fuel. It is still the case, but it is more and more difficult because of the wall and also because uh, of the higher taxes uh, on the border. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not very uh, aware of the timing. Um, I will make a conclusion. I will make two remarks. Uh, two, to minutes. two minutes. Yes. Okay. So uh, this case study underlines two paradoxes regarding the, bar the, the border, according to me. The first one is a tension uh, between security and economic development, because in, we, in one hand, there is the willingness to assure economic security by attracting Iranian tourists, uh, and for example, which Im implying a policy of open border uh, and creates in incentive to better transport connection. But on the other hand, there is the securitization of the borderland area uh, because of the guerrilla with the PKK. So there is a, a kind of dilemma regarding the development of the borderland area and the train uh, between Van and Tabriz is a good example of this tension because it was closed in 2015 because of the guerrilla. Um, and the second remark is that, as we saw with the smuggling issue, uh, border security measures could also lead indirectly to new economic insecurities for borderlanders, uh, which is uh, uh, important to take into account, especially in a context of economic crisis. So, we can see that the meaning of uh, economic security in a borderland area can differ uh, with uh, according to different actors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna, uh, for your presentation. Um, now we are moving to uh, another uh, online uh, a colleague, uh, Meryl Hopper, and uh, she is uh, working at King's College, uh, uh, also with uh, Richard Schofield. And uh, uh, Meryl, I hope you are. And she will present, yes, the art of division, ontologically exploring the materials of division in Israel Palestine. So, Meryl, I leave you the floor for 20 minutes. Okay, I'll just uh, try and get my sharing on <coughs> the right way around. Apologies for this. We see you. Okay, cool. I just need to um, put it back on to my PowerPoint slides. There they are. Yes, now we see your PPT. Brilliant. Fab. Um, yeah, and Meryl, thank you so much to ABS and Daniel and Richard for the organisation of the conference and this panel specifically. Um, so I'm Meryl, I work in the Department of Geography with Richard and Dr Andrew Brooks at, Case, at King's College London. Um, and my work sort of focuses on this idea of division and how it's created and how can we see that, um, how is it made in, in landscapes? And the argument I'll put forward today is the fact that it's this sort of art of division, this art of difference specifically. Um, so my work now focuses on places like Detroit, Berlin and Belfast, specifically looking at border walls um, in all of those locations. Um, 
but to make the uh, session uh, the topic more appropriate to this session I, I'm leaning back on some work I did in my master's at King's College with Richard um, uh, which looked at Israel Palestine but in through using the same lens of thinking about how uh, division and difference manifests in in space so to introduce you to that topic I'll introduce the theory that I use to do so um, so I lend uh, or I borrow from Jack Sterrida and Giles Deleuze, um, this idea of the ontology of difference, which sets difference up as a tangible object of analysis that can be stand, that can stand on its own without the need of anything constituting it, such as identity, which is often um, what's regarded as necessary to studying difference. Instead, they argue that in very different ways, ironically, um, they argue that difference works on its own and it can be studied um, in, in that sense. So Derrida puts forward this idea that difference um, occurs because there's no experience ever purely present. Um, instead, there's just chains of differential markers. And through that negative process, you can understand difference occurs and difference constitutes reality and um, identity. Deleuze does the very opposite thing and says it's a positive process. So difference exists and through um, experience, you encounter difference and therefore learn, learn about it. But fundamentally, I argue that you can bring their work together and say that essentially what we can take is this idea that difference exists, difference of apartness, difference of separa uh, separation, um, that it's pre-existing. And as we navigate through space, it becomes evident. And our identity, our pre-existing identity determines our experience as difference and identity are working concurrently. And there is a constant process. So essentially it sets up difference as not a binary thing of X compared to Y, but instead of a layered multiplicit process, which can be produced across space through, uh, and we can study this through sort of mater the material world, um, as I argued that objects are the material manifestation of ontology. So therefore difference becomes sort of the facilitator of division in space where division is the doing process um, in literal sense. So how are some of the ways that we can see this in space? Well, lots of conversations that we have in the field are on hard and soft borders. These are some examples from my current work. So from taking from Berlin, for example, his territorial demarcations, border walls as they're more commonly known, but as we can appreciate, they're not normally on borders and they're not normally walls. So a bit of a broader category. The interesting thing about this photo is that actually and this is a recreation of the border wall, of the Berlin Wall, but actually it still is the Berlin Wall and there's some sort of irony happening there. You also have natural borders, which we can also appreciate as can be a dangerous term. This is Fox Creek in Detroit, which lies on the border of the city of Detroit and Gross Points. Um, it's a naturally occurring canal, but actually it's toxic um, and full of waste and it has been fortified on one side, the side being that of... Um, the more wealthy region, a city of gross points. Um, to add to this, the other irony is that it's not actually on the border, it's one block across, which makes it, again, natural borders don't tend to conform uh, to the prescribed borders that we look to put down, but nonetheless, they can be used. And just to hammer this natural border point in about this region even, oh, even more, Oh, no, I've lost that, don't worry. Um, you can see it from satellite images, the division um, occurring through this natural way, through tr the tree line, the, the depth of green. Um, we have art. Art quite, quite often feels like resistance, but it's still, still a form of demarcating difference and affording that agency to those resisting it is a way of displaying difference um, in spaces as well. This is National History Art in Belfast, um, which shows the kind of causes they're in solidarity with, but also the regimes that they oppose, i.e. the British regime. Um, the cultural symbols are another one. We can talk about flags, but also in the picture on the right, we can look at language. These are road signs in Belfast in the nationalist areas that are often translated into Gaelic as well. Um, and then you can tell maybe whose side, 
who would go to the pub on the left in Belfast. Um, and then finally, garden fences can also, they're innocuous forms of division that we can see in landscapes as material objects. The irony of this picture um, is that this is actually a border wall that now looks like a garden fence in Detroit. Um, so the point of showing this is to show how we can see difference in space, how different differences play play a role in um, just uh, describing difference, performing difference, and in um, many cases, producing difference in space. Um, and the material world can teach us a lot about that ontological conception of, of what it is to be different and feel different and therefore borders. So for this presentation, I'll look at specific cases in Israel-Palestine. This is um, mainly drawn from work I did for my master's thesis, field work conducted in 2019 in the region. But the point isn't to speak particularly on Israel-Palestine and or um, the, the region more broadly. It's more that what can we take from the region to learn about borders, to learn about this ontology of difference? How will it inform kind of conceptualization of, of what borders are? So to start, I'll look at the formal barrier and the formal forms of division that exist in Ezra Palestine, formal by the definition that it's been laid by a state, in this case, um, by the Israeli state. So here's a map of materiality, um, which shows the different forms of uh, formal um, separate, separation that occurs across the West Bank region. Um, there's a green line demarcated uh, and green. Uh, and then we have two forms of the separation barrier where it takes the, um, the material form of the road and the wall. Uh, but we also have checkpoints, roadblocks, road barriers. There are also seg segregated roads, for example, but due to complexity of um, mapping, I suppose, they've been removed um, in order to have the most clear um, cut representation of firm formal bordering in the region. So let's look at the material composition of the barrier, because the materiality can quite often tell us something about the difference. So for large sections of the separation barrier, it, is, it takes the form of a road. Um, it's a well tarmac, uh, you see a well tarmac road here on the left hand side of the picture. And then on the right, scaling off, you can um, see the start of a fenced road. Um, the space here is often the yeah, fence, there's ditches, raised wire, comb sandy pass, and electronic monitoring systems that all create, come together to create this separation road. This is used in spaces that are rural, um, quite often uh, uninhabited, um, but expand across like vast amounts of that the green line space and the demarcated territory. So this is quite a strategic use. Um, the understanding of difference here is that the difference is not face to face, it's not um, threatening and therefore using this form of securitization is more beneficial. Um, whereas if we then look at the wall, we have a very different experience. Um, so this is, the wall is often um, widely regarded as a strategic point when going through urban centers, needing height um, and elevation in order to uh, be able to do security, I suppose. But even in the fact that the wall looks the same across the full extent of it when you're next to it, there's still differential experiences of... Next of slide, Meryl. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the wall from Jerusalem. So when I was there, I um, very much stuck to, stuck, to, stuck to tourist routes in order to try and experience the space in this particular like, formulated way, I suppose you could argue. Um, the idea being that... This is, a, this is a path, this is a route that a lot of people will take when they visit the region and how would those people experience it? How would they be seeing it and visualizing it? And from Jerusalem, I really struggled to see it as such. And um, this is a small image where I managed to spot it in the distance. I think a view from Mount Scopus is, there's a better view from Mount Scopus if you were to look for it. But the point being here is the difference is very much in the distance. This compares to if you were to visit Bethlehem, where the wall becomes very visible, um, hyper visible to a certain extent. In both sections, the wall is around eight meters high. Each slab is about a meter wide um, and they weigh about 80 tons. So it's a hugely, um, it's a huge physical structure. But nonetheless, the difference that you are experiencing is very different. Um, so the point being that maybe in places where difference is 
on the periphery, it's on the edges, it's looked at as a, as a point of trying to create unity and a, a, a sameness or um, uh, an uninterrupted landscape, shall we say, the difference is disguised, is vis- invisible, whereas where it's, it's um, resisted or um, not agreed with, then it becomes hyper-visible in order to kind of refute it and say, de- like over-demonstrate the, the existence. So this point is furthered by the idea of the two sides of the same wall. So this is um, a photo taken from one side of the wall in Bethlehem and then a screen grab from Google Street View on the other side, on the Israeli side of the wall. And you can see here even the interactions with the same object, the same um, piece of of infrastructure and how the the uses of something like art, like I mentioned earlier, is a way of displaying a difference to difference um, in the sense that it's refuting the fact that it it occurs um, or even acknowledging that it occurs, but disagreeing with the way that it manifests. Um, whereas an, almost an agreement with it is, is an igno- ig- ignoring of the object, which we can see um, on the Israeli side of the wall, where the wall is left as, as any other. So other areas in the, in the um, city can also kind of lend us, um, help us learn about how there has to be points where difference comes face to face with sort of movement, it can't be firm, it can't be rigid like a wall tries to be, it tries to demarcate with no exceptions. And this is points of passage. So I'll offer two main ones. Um, This is the Tim Interchange, it heads out on Route 1 as exiting Jerusalem due east. Um, And you can see this is the same um, section of the road and we're on the, um, the side heading east out of Jerusalem. So on this side of the road, there's no checkpoint. The road is the the road is smooth. It's uh, there's no friction. However, on the other side, we can see the appearance of a checkpoint. So on the exact same sort of spatial coordinate, we can see this idea of unity and friction occurring at the same time. So difference not being uniform to all that experience the space, especially depending on direction. So we're starting to build this picture here that right difference again isn't binary, it's multiplicit. And depending on who you are and the knowledge you gain and the knowledge you have, you have this different experience um, of spaces and we interact with them and we're taught them by the spaces that are around us. This is further by Old City Gates. That's This is within Jerusalem, um, but around the edge of the Old City there. Uh, we ha- I have two gates here. Um, we have the Jaffa Gate, which is uh, on the outside of the Christian, like on the kind of um, edge of the Christian and Armenian quarters within the old city, and the Damascus Gates, which is an entrance point to the main entrance point to the Muslim quarter. So outside of the Damascus Gate, it's very small, but there is a small se- permanent security hut that's built into the landscape. Whereas in the Jaffa Gate, you can see that there's just this small table that's foldable with sort of security personnel just lent against the wall. So this is demonstrating how even within a space that's described as military, it's not on a friction point of, of a walling space or um, an old walling space, not a modern one. Um, there's actually a difference in spatial uh, spatialities happening. So traveling through um, the gate at the, uh, uh, a, so a, through traveling in the gate at the at, um, through the gate in the Muslim quarter out through the Damascus gate into the rest of um, Jerusalem, the infrastructure quickly communicates the author- the change in authority of space or the change, the difference in the space that you are moving through. Whereas the Jaffa gate has this idea of fluidity again through the, the through the lack of securitization or the absence of it. So this is showing some of the formal ways that um, we can look at material manifestations of difference in in landscapes and how we can learn about what it is what is the difference occurring here and how is that lending itself to bordering practice because they're co- they're, they're um kind of guiding each other in their reality one feeds the other and the other feeds back sort of a theory lent from um sts th- uh studies um But then the question is asked of other forms of division. This is where I expanded my project at the time. And I started to think of other objects that do division. Do they have to be walls? Because walls aren't very good. 
are other 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 objects more effective and affective in fact um at doing difference because of the ways in which difference can be manipulated so now i turn to informal division so the first object i present is um the, what was dubbed the black forest by national geographic but black water tanks these sit on the top of Palestinian houses in the region um, as the water pipes and water supply is um, less good to um, those houses and therefore the fact that water tanks are necessary and in, in order to have good access to water. So when you understand that about the object, you can then start to see differences in the landscape, i.e. you can identify a Palestinian house or a Palestinian neighborhood separate from an Israeli one despite the fact that the communities might be living in, a, in a, uh, a mixed way, such as reality in large parts of Jerusalem. Um, and this photo is taken with it from Jerusalem um, over sort of from that ramparts walk of the old city. So we can start to see that with knowledge of what an object is, then a difference can be revealed. But without that knowledge, you may just look across this landscape and not see any form of division. And therefore we start to ask the question, is that more beneficial because it can be more directed? And therefore these ideas of having unity at the same time as difference can work a bit more effectively because you only give difference to those who are opposed to telling everyone that there's friction and conflict occurring. Another way we can see this is even in um, settlements. So often regarded, well, defined as buildings which ride the hillsides, settlements tend to sit on tops of hillsides, looking out over valleys and um, beyond that, that space. This is um, a Jewish settlement outside of Bethlehem, Harhoma. Um, and you can see across this on in the far side, um, you can see how the buildings have this feeling of looking outwards. Um, there tends to be in the architecture and design of the towns and, and settlements that there's one road coming in and one road going out. So it has this fortress-like um, appearance. So the settlement is another way in which we can think about how landscapes communicate to one group. If you understand a settlement, if you can spot a settlement, then you might understand about that idea of surveillance and securitization happening in the region. If you don't, maybe it's just another Palestinian settlement and or not undefined, just another space that occurs. So again, we have this like dualism happening of <clears throat> who knows and who doesn't and why that could be quite beneficial. And the final one I wanted to bring up was signs. Signs are really interesting in the region. Um, here's three different ones that exist in three different spaces. Um, as you can see, the, uh, there's absence and presence of language. And that tends to communicate different types of differences that occur. Who needs, because co as communication is a point of access, it is, a key to a gate in the um, informal sense of division. It is a way of being able to navigate space. The presence and absence of language, therefore, on things like road signs, directional signs, can tell you about the ways in which people are experiencing the space. Who is the space for? Um, or why is that absence? Absence tends to be just as, as telling as presence in, in this kind of conceptualization of borders. Um, so to conclude, I just wanted to leave with that idea of the multiplicity, difference is a multiplicity um, concept. It can be manifested in many ways. Um, but the, the layering of experience, the layering of identity through different spatial markers, such as objects, um, allows difference and division to be done at complex levels. So I used Israel-Palestine in a way of viewing this um, in order to show there's the formal division happening in the space, but also quite um, performative and productive forms of informal division. And if we're trying to take this to the ontological level, we're thinking about the ways in which the space comes to be. And if we're enacting that idea of difference as something innate to our ontological understandings of space, then things like materials become the, the, the 
um, clues and uh, just uh, hints towards the ways in which those differences are being taught discursively through narratives. Um, so the the in demonstrating that fluctuating social life of objects, despite their physical stance, we can start to play on that um, idea of borders being everywhere and nowhere in the fact that we can argue that actually happens at the same time. So there's a lot of ironies at play and that's what I'm working on now to try and take the wall as a specific object of um, kind of ironic failure, I suppose we could say, um, in trying to construct it, and uh, trying to then learn from it, um, to try and think of new ways that we can we can approach borders um, and bordering problems. Thank you so much, and I hope that was okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, for this uh, great presentation, and uh, now we can. Uh, so I repeat, keep your questions uh, uh, for uh, the, the, the question session that we follow. And uh, therefore, immediately, I'm uh, going to call uh, Moran Zaga uh, to, uh, 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 from the University of Haifa uh, uh, to uh, uh, her presentation on the role of the importance of modern enclaves in the United Arab Emirates. Okay. Thank you, uh, Daniel, for organizing this session, for inviting me. Um, so my um, interest is uh, in territorial and political enclaves and exclaves, and um, UAE and Oman has, as far as I know, the only official um, enclaves and exclaves in the Middle East, in the Arab world, while excluding other cases of disputes. And my question that I pose here is, uh, are these enclaves or exclaves a uh, territorial solution in the sense of giving or allowing different identities to exist in physical manifestation? Or are there pose a problem for present um, um, administration uh, by creating spatial imbalance? So that's my main interest uh, for today. And uh, it's based on an article paper that was published just a month ago at the Journal of um, Geography Research Forum. Uh, the region that I'm focusing on is right here at the Arabian Peninsula, at the north uh, tip of uh, the UAE and north of Oman. And you can see only by looking at this map, the complexity of borders that we see here today. And there are lots of unique features. Uh, again, in the world, in the uh, Middle East, uh, depends how you describe what we left. Um, one unique feature is that uh, the UAE is the only federation um, in the Arab uh, world. Um, there are so many curved borderlines here. Uh, there are many curved borderlines in the Middle East, but uh, you can see the, um, the magnitude of this phenom phenomena here in just a small scale uh, region. Um, you can see, as said, a uh, lot of enclaves of many types, and I will mention them in one second. And the region is highly, highly fragmented. There are in the one screenshot that we see here, you have at least 11 types of, um, 11, sorry, enclaves in different types. And the different types that we have here are, for example, the most extreme, or I think uh, uh, um, almost insane case that we have here is a Nahwa village, which, is, which is, belongs or affiliates to the Emirate of Sharjah, which is part of the U UAE, uh, enclaved, by, enclaved by Oman, a fully Oman territory, uh, in the name of uh, Madha, surrounded by other different Emirates of the UAE. So there's a country uh, within a country within a country. So that's a second order enclave. Uh, inside an exclave, there are semi-exclaves, uh, such as the Musandam here, uh, meaning that part of the territory is surrounded by the sea. There are mere exclaves, meaning that the surrounding political entities, uh, th there are several political entities surrounding the exclave. And most of the cases here are subnational level exclave, meaning that they are part of the 
federation and not national level actually. Um, I focused on the creation, how, uh, what were the conditions that led to this uniqueness that we see here on the map? Uh, and I think the more interesting question is how these, these uh, unique features survived into the modern state, because in most of them, there were many, many exclaves and enclaves in the uh, pre-modern era, but um, what is unique here is that they survived and absorbed into the modern state. And of course, what is the role and significance today? These are the main tools that are used. I used. They ask the territorial questions on enclaves. I did some archival uh, survey on the British archives in the region and uh, special analysis, uh, looking at historical maps and survey of contemporary policy records and, and media records. So I will show you today two um, case studies. One of them is a Dubai exclave named Khata, on the name of the main village here, which is stationed here, and the adjacent exclave of Ajman, another emirate, which is mother territory, sits right here on the coast, and um, its exclave is here. There is another Ajman exclave right here named Manama, not to confuse with Manama, the capital of Bahrain. Um, so these are the two case studies that I'm going to focus on, and uh, let's start with how this, the, how this is um, exclave created. Uh, so one of the main conditions that led to the creation is the topographic, the geographic uh, and physical conditions. Um, looking at this picture, we see the, um, we can already, uh, as geographer, understand the advantage of um, uh, in the pre-modern world, in the pre-technological world, sitting at mountains. Uh, the mountains create an orographic um, barrier, which um, creates this gigantic desert, Ruba al Khali, the main desert of the Arabian Peninsula. And 90% of the UAE sits on this desert, arid desert, with no living conditions uh, except oasis and coastlines. So most of the tribal population sit right here at wadis, meaning valleys, uh, coastlines, foothills. Uh, that uh, created the conditions of living. These two enclaves that I'm talking about today are sitting uh, as well on the Wadi Khata, important Wadi. And um, the precipitation rate here is rather high compared to the inland. Uh, the Wadis create ability to create to, to, to practice uh, agriculture. And uh, the rocky um, the Rocky Mountains create uh, uh, underground water and many water resources. And in this historical map of um, water resources, we can see a complete match between water wells and villages, like 100% match. Every water well they had, a village was built around it. So we can see here uh, Ajmani Masfut and Dubai, uh, the, the old name of Hata was Khajarian. Uh, so the geographic uh, explanation creates a lot of sense, but uh, because of, uh, it's, it's not the only explanation, because of the geographical advantages of the area, many uh, rulers uh, sought to control the region. And we can see the many uh, political changes that occurred along the last three centuries. Uh, the region was uh, mainly ruled by the Sultan of Muscat <laughs> back in the seventh century. Uh, then the Kawas and tribal coalition became dominant, starting to create the first unofficial free modern enclaves in the region. The Kawasim itself split along the uh, century to two heads, two family uh, members who uh, later built uh, the two days Emirates of Ras al Khaimah and Sharjah. So there was another, slip, uh, uh, another split within the split. Uh, Britain, which uh, arrived and conquered the region in uh, the 19th century, early 19th century, um, um, weakened the Kawasim family and the Kawasim maritime abilities, um, um, reducing their ability to maintain control over the coast uh, cities and um, allowing other local uh, tribes or rulers to gain power. So we see that the Swiss cheese is starting to get more and more holes in the political map, uh, allowing Fujairah ruler and as we said, Ajman in Dubai to get 
further control of the region. There is a famous painting of um, the uh, in, in um, 90, um, it, it, sorry, um, yes, 1920 uh, 1920s. Um, uh, showing Britain uh, conquering Ras al Khaimah, which used to be the capital of the region, not today's uh, Abu Dhabi. And we see there, uh, I think that's the most important part of the drawing, uh, showing the ships on fire, um, really leading to the deterioration in uh, the Kawasan abilities to work. Um, but here we see that uh, both Khata and Masfut are cases where Muscat was still around, Muscat is still ruling in this time, and uh, both Dubai and Najman gained their um, uh, control over uh, the Sultan of Muscat and not uh, the Khawasan. So we have many, many local forces here, and um, one of the major, I think, um, um, factors that enabled the region to maintain its local features is that uh, local, uh, uh, sorry, external forces such as the Ottoman Empire and other empires did not enter, or when they entered the region, did not intervene intensive, intensively enough to interfere with the local developments. Um, so uh, we see lots of, um, let's say, tribal. Um, structures and tribal processes absorbing into the modern um, era, uh, into the modern phase, and the transitional phase, the survival of the uh, local features into the national state is many, in many ways, thanks to the different Britain uh, approach that we had here in delineating the borders of the Middle East. We heard a few cases where we saw how um, uh, we saw how external forces, how Britain and France drew the lines of the Middle East. Here we see a different story. The delineation started at a fairly, a very late stage in the political order of the world at the 30s, only in the 1930s. And, um, um, and the duration of the, um, of, the, the, of the border negotiations was rather Lap was rather long until the six, uh, 60s at least. And um, due to this um, long and uh, very late um, border negotiations, the, uh, the British representatives in the region came with a little uh, different approach. They asked the uh, local chiefs and the local people, what is their um, local uh, structure, tribal structure? And according to their identities or according to the tribal loyalties, they drew the borders uh, to, uh, to circle them and, um, <laughs> and uh, eliminating the option of territorial contiguity. In most of, other, uh, in most of the other cases in the Middle East, we know that territorial con contiguity was one of the more um, uh, important factors in creating the modern state. But here, territorial contiguity was less important. What was on the top level of uh, consideration was who they give the loyalty to. And according to that, borders were drawn. We can see a, a game solution to, um, to, to the two identities in the national era. One identity is the, uh, is the tribal coalition. If Hatta, the people of Hatta or the people of Masfud give the loyalty to the ruler who sits here in Najman, they will not uh, uh, they will not reduce them, they will not ignore them, they will just circle them with um, uh, with uh, with a border, giving them two identities. One is the primordial identity, and now they have a new Emirati identity, which was not existed until 1971. So they gave a sort of solution to uh, territorial identities. And um, this approach is mainly to people like uh, Julian Walker, who actually drew this background um, sketch map. Um, and we can see her sit, uh, sitting on the sand with a local, uh, uh, I don't know, a sheikh or um, one of the people. And, and uh, you, can see, you can see the approach, dif the different approach trying to see uh, eye to eye. Let's go to, uh, for today. Uh, ski for today and uh, ask what is the significance of these exclaves and enclaves today? Because uh, we can understand that when the country um, emerged, 
it was important enough to maintain these identity which were still dominant but are these tribal identities still dominate today and are these new territorial or emirati identity um, relinquish the need of these exclaves. We can see here the ruler of Dubai, Muhammad bin Rashid al-Maktoum, as his son, uh, Hamdan, the crown prince, going physically to Khata, this beautiful uh, wadi, this beautiful place, and announcing the uh, Khata Muslim Development Plan, which I will speak about in a few seconds, um, just to give you an overview of the differences today between Khata of Dubai and Masfut of Ajman. Both cities are relatively distant from the main Dubai and Ajman city. Hatta has a little bit more resident, but food is still in practice. Um, um, oh, sorry, there are a, a collection of villages in Masfut, while uh, there is one main uh, Hatta city uh, in the Dubai um, in the Dubai section. And there is, um, as you can see here, there are govern governmental uh, villas. Uh, in an urban planning well organized in the city of Matcha, while you can see here that not most of the roads are not paved in uh, Masfut, and uh, the houses are spontaneously developed, uh, same as for the infrastructure, in, infrastructures, sorry, that are spontaneously developed here. Um, and what is their geopolitical importance Today, why would the rulers of Ajman and Dubai have the interest to maintain their separate political entity and not create and not absorb it into the more than unified administrated um, entity of the UAE? So we can see first that from the location is that both of these territories has an access to the international border with Oman. Now, the unique feature, another unique feature here is that these borders are not administrated are not administrated on the federal level. They are administrated on the Emirati level, meaning that Dubai has control on the taxes, on tourism, on trading, on everything that the border <coughs> offers. And it offers, meaning that, they off, that it offers a lot of political um, um, status, a uh, high political status for whoever controls it. So Dubai controls the border here, Ajman controls the border here, but interestingly enough, and I don't know the reason for that, but the international border for Ajman with Oman, which you can see here is important because it really, um, uh, it really connects the two sections of the UAE and creates for those who want to visit here a faster way but most of the time it is closed. And this is a more busy international border. So that's one thing. Hatta and uh, Ajman at both has dams, but Hatta is using the dam um, uh, more in intensively, meaning that it has hydroelectric station. Uh, it uses that for uh, um, channeling agriculture, um, channeling water for agriculture and for tourism. Uh, in Hatta, for example, there's the only hotel in the radius of, I don't know, at least 50 or 70 kilometers in the region. Of course, Masfud does not offer that. You can see here some pictures of the zip line and, and the small hotels that, uh, um, that you have in the Advantage Park in Wadi Hab in Hatta. You can see the Wadi Dam, uh, the, sorry, the dam in Hatta, which also offers um, I don't know, touristic attractions such as small uh, sailing boats. And you can see the international border. Um, this is me when I was thin. Um, uh, you can see that it's, it really does not remind anything of, um, of what we uh, imagine when we think about tribal uh, borders, right? 20 years ago, there was no border here. I mean, there was a checkpoint but you could not see the fence, you did not see any fence, you did not need to see any patrol, you did not see these signs. These are all new features or new physical uh, appearances that we see on the ground today. And just, uh, I asked him to, to make a photo of me just to show the background, not myself. <laughs> um, so we can see here the appearance of the border. And let's see the borderland between the two enclaves between the two political entities. This is Hatta, 
this is my foot. And you can see only from an area look, the difference, the big difference and disparity and the social and, 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 and the uh, 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 imbalance between the, two, uh, between the two entities. You can see the well-planned Hata area. You can see the football stadium. You see a lot of grass. And here you can see agricultural lands. You see spontaneous uh, scattered houses and uh, nothing on the borderland. This um, uh, Google Earth pictures from 2009, I think. Um, and I want to show you what's happening today. I go back, just look at the borderland and see how the houses are getting closer to each other. And now it's a connected area. This is the federal border, uh, the federative border, sorry. And as, uh, as closer as they get, as the disparity is becoming more visible and more felt on the ground for the people who are sitting here and here. The structures, the water structure, the electricity structure, the paved roads, they're all end here for both sides, creating two different circles of political and social administration. Uh, looking forward, both Ajman and Dubai understand the situation. They are aware of the situation. And what are they doing to change that? So Ajman, knows its, um, let's say, disadvantage in this uh, uh, comparison. And they start slowly by slowly to develop the city and offer um, attractions. Nothing today attract a tourist to Ajman, but only uh, the last two years, they opened a small museum. This is the Crown Prince, Crown Prince of Ajman, and announced the same year a plan to 2030 for modernizing the city planning. Now let's see what Dubai is offering in reaction to Ajman. So there is, as we saw earlier, the Hatta Master Development Plan, again, announced the same year. And the vision that, here is a quote about the vision, transforming Hatta into an attractive local and international destination for business, investment, and tourism. See the different goals here. They, they, they take not two steps, but 10 steps ahead of Ajman, creating an even larger disparity and special imbalance. So ending at my questions that I posed in the first slide, are the territorial, are, is, is, are these, uh, sorry, exclusive territorial solution a problem? Of course, there are sort of a solution for these um, dual identities that exist, still exist in the UAE, but uh, as we can see here, there are social and political tensions that we cannot see when we look from a high level at on the UAE. We see a lovey-dovey picture of homogeneous uh, society and homogeneous political structure, but looking uh, at a zoom-in level, we can see uh, the cracks and the tensions between the different Emirates and how they cannot even uh, share uh, infrastructures and small um, political, uh, sorry, small territorial units. Thank you very much. Really interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, stimulating, stimulating uh, presentation also to consider in KVX case. So now uh, um, we are moving to uh, our last present presenter, uh, Chaim Sperro. Um, Chaim, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Ah, wonderful. Here you are. So uh, from the Israeli survey department, so uh, uh, some of the people here know you, of course. Uh, uh, and so uh, uh, you're going to uh, 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 elaborate on, on a provisional title I received 28 years of successful joint Israeli Jordanian boundary making and boundary maintenance. I'll leave you the floor for 20 minutes. Thank you very much for letting me in. Uh, due to the COVID, I'm not at my best, but I'll try to do the best I can. Uh, I am uh, actually uh, uh, a member of the Israel-Jordan uh, uh, Boundary Commission and the co-founder 
uh, of the joint team of experts in the Joint Boundary Commission uh, since July 1994, more than three months before the peace treaty. The Just a minute. Okay. Now the the boundary, the, the mission of the joint team of experts uh, was uh, to prepare the boundary delimitation, the peace treaty, the boundary demarcation on the ground after the peace treaty, the boundary surveying and the documentation of the boundary pillars the maritime boundary delimitation in the Gulf of Aqaba and the documentation of the boundary line in the south of the Dead Sea and the salt pans and in the Jordan and Yarmouk rivers. Uh, people may think that, uh, well, we are now on the 29th year after uh, the peace treaty. Why do you still need maintenance? I hope that I will uh, introduce you a uh, few facts uh, that will convince you that such uh, maintenance process is very important. Uh, the modes of operation of the JTE were defined in the SOP standard operation procedures that we have uh, prepared uh, in the JTE. And this was approved by the chairs of the JBC. The chairs of the JBC preparing a new report of the JT, preparing a new report to be approved by the chairs of the JBC. In rare cases of disagreements, the heads of the JT have the option to raise the issues uh, to the chairs of the JBC. Actually, the JT is the, the, the main uh, operative organ of the JBC. Uh, the two sides uh, interact continuously. They conduct annual field uh, reconnaissance survey, uh, field and office meetings on both sides, uh, annual sum up meeting following these meetings and for preparing an annual report. And the military uh, liaison network enables easy communication between the two sides because Otherwise, we would need uh, maybe visas or I don't know what, but we have uh, a free uh, uh, free connection, let us say it in this uh, frame. Uh, the types of boundary maintenance issues uh, are uh, actually complex. Uh, there are issues due to see and this is of course due to the the area of this boundary the boundary itself uh, has about four or five hundred kilometers but if you don't take the meanders of the rivers then you have about 400 kilometers boundary uh, on the land boundary in the araba uh, maritime boundary in the gulf of Aqaba Elat, a boundary in a lake the dead sea and the boundary in the rivers, the Jordan River and the Yarmouk Rivers. Now the maintenance problems or issues are due to sea water and wind erosion, issues due to floods, issues due to uh, natural changes in rivers, issues due to man-made changes, and issues due to combination of climate changes and man-made changes. Examples of uh, seawater erosion and sand dune movement, you can see here on the left side, you see a boundary pillar uh, number zero, which is also called BP zero, but it's also MB zero, maritime boundary zero. Uh, that's the first point of the maritime boundary no. line. On the left side, you see the original one put on the see, ground. We don't, we don't see your, your, we don't see your, your PowerPoint. You don't see my PowerPoint? <laughs> uh, I don't, what shall I do? Uh, Stop sharing and sharing it again. Oh, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> But you, you saw it before? 
No, no, no. Ah, we, you didn't see anything? No, no, no. We 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 we, we see you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, you can, you, you can tell him what to do. Yeah, uh, fine. You just need to start sharing. Okay. Okay. Now you see it? Yes. Yeah. Now it's fine. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, so th this, these are the examples of uh, seawater erosion. Uh, uh, and Sandil's movement. On the left side, you see the original uh, BP0 on the coastline, on the ground, and then the, the salty water, uh, of course, uh, and the winds also uh, uh, influenced it and it began uh, cracking. So we elevated it on, uh, on uh, stones and this was not enough. And so we uh, constructed, everything was, was done and is done and will be done, of course, jointly, the Jordanians and us, yes. And uh, a three-level uh, base was built and the new boundary pillar was put on top of it. Uh, that was in 2009. Now on the right side, you can see that sand dunes cover sometimes boundary pillars or sometimes they expose the base and the, the pillar may be tilted. Now on the left side, that's uh, referring now, I'm referring now to maintenance due to floods. On the left side, you see boundary pillar one, very close uh, to boundary pillar zero. And, but since 2009, you can see it was also uh, constructed uh, on a few levels, two levels in this case, uh, concrete uh, base. But you can see that from the floods coming from the north, actually the base deteriorated and now needs uh, an urgent, I would say, maintenance. And we are taking care of it. Uh, this is uh, another pillar in the uh, middle of a seasonal uh, wadi. Yes, so the, the, the floods there are very strong and the, the original uh, pillar actually was swept away by one of the floods. Uh, so we, uh, we constructed actually uh, a base of a concrete base, two levels, and put a new boundary pillar uh, on top of it. But the situation now uh, is uh, different because you see another uh, powerful flood actually uh, tilted the boundary pillar and the base itself. Here you see the meanders of the Jordan River, as you can see, the, the every river. Yes, is actually a, a living uh, organ. Yes, or creature or whatever, a, uh, or a ge geographic uh, feature. And it changes all the time, every second, every millisecond. Uh, so we have to take care uh, if, if, if uh, a river is a boundary river, then the question is uh, if the, the, the changes of the river are uh, gradual and slow, uh, then the boundary line should follow the changes of the river. But if, it is an artificial, a man-made change, then the boundary remains at the original, uh, and the, original uh, the original location. And if it is uh, due to a, a, a sudden change, then it depends on the decision of the, of the committee. Another thing is, uh, if we refer to natural changes in the river, here you see an example of a collapse, a collapse of the bank. Yes, a very high wall of the river, it collapsed. And you can see here that the river, in this case, the Jordan River, changed, yes, its course. So the question, should the boundary move with the change of the river or not? 
all these things actually come to the JTE or JTE, the JTE comes to these cases and uh, has to solve uh, the problems. Here you see man-made changes that uh, has to be taken care of. On the left side, you see a place on the Yarmouk River where a dam, yes, here you see the dam constructed, but before it was constructed, uh, it was planned in order to divert the water from the Yarmouk River to Jordan. Actually, this the Yarmouk is the main source of water for agriculture in the Jordanian side, east of the, uh, in the Jordan Valley, east of the uh, Jordan River. Yes, so we knew that after this dam will be constructed, then the river will not behave like it used to, to behave uh, before. And uh, you see here uh, also a uh, reservoir, yes, uh, upstream from the dam. And you see that the, the water yes, that it doesn't flow as it used to flow before. So we actually, we fixed the boundary coordinates according to the bound, original boundary delimitation of the peace treaty. This is another case where a gas pipe has to be constructed below the Jordan River. So we had temporarily to take the, the, the to divert the water vertically through pipes, yes, to dig this channel in order to put the gas pipe and then to restore the Jordan River in its place. And since the Jordan River is a boundary river, then uh, there was a lot of work Yes, for engineering, uh, for the engineering uh, staff, but also for the JT because the JT controlled everything in order to be uh, sure that the boundary will uh, will be uh, restored. Yes, and in any case, it fixed the boundary uh, coordinates according to the original delimitation of the peace treaty. Here you see on the right side, uh, because of uh, construction. Of dikes and the road, the new road, uh, uh, boundary road, uh, and a, a very high fence. Yes, uh, a dike was built here, and the, the, the dike covered all boundary pillars. So we had to construct here, and on the right side, you, you can see it, to construct here actually a, a new base about two meters high or even more, and to put the boundary pillar on top of it. Yes, so actually the coordinates today of this boundary pillar, the X, Y coordinates are the same as the documentation that we have prepared uh, 25 years ago. But the, the Z coordinate is different because it's now elevated. This is another case, it's a combination of climate and man-made uh, changes. Uh, you see the Dead Sea, the original Dead Sea and the Dead Sea today. And uh, you can see that because the Dead Sea contracts, yes, uh, then the, the northern coastline of the Dead Sea moves southwards. Now, the original uh, boundary used to be during the British mandate along the Jordan River down to the, to the estuary, uh, to the Dead Sea. But since the Dead Sea contracted, now the river chose a new, uh, uh, <clears throat> a new location, yes? So we, we already saw it during the peace treaty. So we changed the delimitation from the British mandate. You see the red line and actually we adjusted it uh, to the to the new uh, uh, Jordan River, yes, uh, in this area, but uh, this is is still continuing. So we have a problem, and we have to take care uh, of this problem, uh, of this issue, uh, constantly. Here uh, we can see joint projects, uh, which is the main issue that I refer to. Uh, the JT uh, actually maintains and not only maintains, conducts uh, joint projects. One of them 
is a basic one, which was to, to prepare a, a joint a reference, geodetic reference system, boundary reference system, in order to, uh, to base all the, the surveys uh, referring to the boundary, like actually uh, uh, fixing coordinates uh, for boundary pillars for the, the Jordan River and the Amuk River and in the Dead Sea, uh, using these uh, uh, actually reference points. That was one project, a successful one. Another one, uh, actually, that was my uh, idea, but we actually offered it to the Horizon program, but we failed. <laughs> but you can see the, 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 the idea. My idea was that since uh, Jordan in this area is, is on the Arabian plate, while Israel is on the African plate, here we have Cyprus and uh, <coughs> Greece from the European Union, yes, as, as uh, on the Euro-Asian plate, or maybe here you can refer to it as the Anatolian plate. So maybe uh, we can uh, monitor the differential uh, uh, movement, yes, uh, of these control points, Yes, the suggested control points for, uh, from my point of view, for hundreds of hundred years, yes, or tens of years, at least, to see what happens here uh, uh, annually and uh, a long time on the long range. Uh, uh, so, as I said, we uh, didn't uh, receive the fund, but uh, what you can see here, uh, very interesting. You see this black line. This is actually the Dead Sea Rift, which is called also the Syrian African Fault. The northern tip of it, you can see it. Yes, the, the meeting point between the northern tip of this Dead Sea Rift, yes, and the southern edge margin of the Southeast Anatolian plate is exactly the place, unfortunately, of the last two uh, disastrous uh, earthquakes a week ago. You can see here, this area, exactly the meeting, the meeting area between these two. Now another, oops, another uh, project you see on the right side, uh, which we signed just two months ago, uh, that was uh, uh, actually a joint marine uh, safety of navigation uh, chart uh, following the rules of the British Admiralty. And uh, uh, you can see here the, the Royal Jordanian Geographic Center, Survey of Israel, the JT. It's a product of the JT, but a joint with all of uh, these uh, uh, organizations. <clears throat> and uh, it's very interesting. It is a trilingual. It's English, Arabic, and Hebrew. Uh, I'm very proud of it. It was my idea. And, uh, <laughs> and conclusion, the existence of joint, a joint team of experts for the maintenance of an international boundary is essential for the stability of the boundary. Such a joint team has to be active and meet and cooperate routinely and at least on an annual basis. I have to say that uh, our, uh, our work is highly appreciated by both sides. And it's actually, uh, uh, I would say, uh, it's been declared lately as uh, a major important contributor to uh, peace and uh, security uh, between the, the two states. Uh, oops, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks to uh, all the participants uh, to, uh, for their presentation.
and uh, uh, to be uh, uh, with us now for the session question. I mean, so please now raise your hand and let's uh, let take some questions. Yes. Sorry, is uh, Haim still with us? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Haim, thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. I just wanted to clarify. So does it mean that uh, the border is basically moving all the time because of the changes in the, uh, uh, you know, in the geography, in the river? Uh, uh, so does it mean that every time, I mean, not every time, but basically you, the joint team is delimitating the border every time to adjust it to the new uh, natural realities? Uh, no, not exactly. I mean, the maritime boundary that we have uh, delimited and signed in 1996, of course, is uh, it's in the sea, but this is the, the most stable part of it because it's defined by coordinates. So we have one uh, part uh, fully stable. Uh, another part is the boundary on land, yes, in the Arabah. Uh, in this case, uh, the boundary is uh, fully, fully uh, documented by coordinates, and uh, these coordinates are uh, deposited uh, at the United Nations. So, uh, of course, uh, this is also stable. The, the boundary pillars, yes, may fall down or need or re require uh, maintenance, but the boundary line is defined, fully defined ex accurately uh, by coordinates. My, my idea is uh, on all uh, the Israeli boundaries, and I think that this should be also uh, all, all over the world, that boundaries should be defined by coordinates. Uh, and, uh, uh, and other things, if you need to, to change maybe in rivers, then you have to, to, to change it or to maintain it or uh, to define the rules of the changes, yes, and to keep track on it because in the, regarding the, the Dead Sea and the salt pans, it's also stable over there, except, as I said, uh, referring to the northern coastline of the Dead Sea, not because... Uh, because of the Dead Sea, but yes, because of the Dead Sea, but because of the Jordan River. The jo Jordan River, if the northern uh, coastline of the Dead Sea moves, uh, migrates southwards, then the, the Jordan River has to elongate itself, has to find a way, yes, to reach the Dead Sea. And it doesn't operate according to our uh, 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 directives, it is uh, a natural uh, uh, feature. So, uh, so in this case, uh, I think that we have to, to follow it, but we haven't decided it yet. Regarding the, the, the boundaries in the rivers, uh, yes, this is what well, the boundary, uh, the, the, the peace of treaty defines uh, uh, the, the boundary in this area, as I mentioned before. Uh, so it should change according to the natural changes of the river. If the natural changes of the river are uh, slow and gradual. So uh, actually, uh, uh, if this is the case, then yes, we have to change it. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there some questions? Yes. No. I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Zaga uh, about uh, British policy. It seems like the British policy regarding the enclaves is extremely extraordinary in the context of the Middle East. And I wondered why specific, particularly there, they were more considerate towards local divisions rather than uh, their overwhelming <laughs> policy in just drawing borders wherever they thought it would be serve their own interests. So and other I have two assumptions. One is that uh, Britain was present in this region since uh, 1820. Uh, so the, there were at least 110 uh, years uh, uh, experience in the region. 
and getting to know the region, making surveys of the region uh, for a century uh, before they start the negotiations. So they had a lot of knowledge on the region and on the population. And the other reason that I, uh, um, it's, it's a hypothesis, which I need to uh, further check, but um, that is that they took conclusions from the process here in the Levant and they tried to implement it in a better way in the Gulf area. Thank you. That's my assumption that I'm doing further research. I have a question. I'm curious to learn about the uh, manifestation of Turkish intervention in northern Syria. What does it mean? How many soldiers uh, and how deeply they're intervening on the social life? And how does that affect the everyday life of Syrians? You mean the, the intervention in northern Syria? Well, it's, uh, it's a special uh, issue because, uh, well, Turkey um, reinforced the services in his area. And officially, Turkey has no ambition, territorial ambition on uh, the Syrian uh, sovereignty and the Syrian uh, territory. But when looking at what's happening in his zone, uh, Turkey's building uh, even university in the zone. So <laughs> I think at the so beginning, the idea was to uh, to have a leverage in the the final issue of uh, the Syrian uh, uh, civil war and to defend, especially uh, Turkish interest in the. Uh, the, 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 end, the end and the managing of the of the border because this border has a long story but when looking at what's happening well uh, we can have a question about that uh, well I think also this uh, this zone is uh, it is a, an old dream of the Turkish government since the beginning uh, well, since the beginning, you know, you have uh, this migration and immediately one of the first reflex of, reflex of Turkey was to uh, claim for the establishment of a sort of buffer zone. And at that time, this was the beginning to also with the, this conflict between Turkey and the Allies because the US refused because establishing a, a buffer zone uh, would that mean to uh, control, to check the, 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 the airspace of the zone. And this will uh, let the, the US and the Western uh, ally to a direct confrontation with the Syrian regime. That was uh, that why they refused. But now with this intervention too, well, uh, uh, Turkey has this... Uh, uh, argument of the buffer zone, especially Erdogan is explaining that he's going to uh, send back the refugees to the, the zone. Some of them move to the zone, but the majority stay in, in Turkey, especially because sometimes they are not coming from the, the zone of the, the intervention. So it's, uh, well, it's a difficult situation, I think. <laughs> Uh, just two notes, not a question. One for the uh, girl from the researcher from uh, King's College. Al Khoma is a neighborhood of Jerusalem. It's not a settlement, as it, we seen like this. So this is one thing. And the other things, I try to present it to you at the time. You know this because all of you got it. The boundary that we talk, and this is all on the shelf. <laughs> this part of the boundary between Israel and uh, Jordan is not boundary between Israel and Jordan. Yeah. No, you have to see because nobody know what is this. This is the West Bank. It's not part of Israel and it's not, uh, it's under part of it under the uh, a Palestinian authority, which is not a state. So this is not boundary, although Israel 
and Chaim and other control it and try to see what's going on the river, but this is part of the river uh, of the line, this is part of the line, but this part is not a boundary line. Mm. Uh, may I say something? It is a boundary line. The, uh, it's the western boundary of Jordan, but it's not the eastern no, boundary. No, it's, 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 the, it's a boundary line. It's part of the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty uh, in Chapter 3 of the uh, Article 3 of the uh, International Boundary. But the status of it mm -hmm. yes, is defined as a temporary status until the status of the areas west of it, the West Bank, will be decided. Yeah. Actually, at the Jordanians' insistence, Israel is the only uh, sovereign uh, in, in terms for security, not for civilian issues, but yes, Jordan yes. does yes. not recognize yes, Palestinians as yes. having security control over the of that section okay. of the border mm -hmm. at Jordanian insistence. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> a question over there. Thank you very much for your attention. My question is Johanna Oliver about Van. Okay, Who Johanna, are you with us? And uh, which is the border city in Turkey? And I have been conducting my field research in that as well. So my question is the construction of border wall. Uh, Johanna, do you hear it? Yeah, I I, I am here. I not I didn't hear the question yet. Okay, a little bit louder. Okay. Uh, my question is the, about border uh, wall. Uh, what about the effects of capitalist economy, uh, expansion of these regions in terms of economic policies? And uh, this is related to your topics as well. Arabic belt or just uh, buffer zone? The question is Arabic belt or buffer zones? Arabic. Arabic belt. Belt. This is the policy, and Erdogan always says this is the Arabic belt between Syria and Turkey. And this is the next question, actually. My question is, what's the effect of capitalist war economy uh, on these regions? Uh, because the, the border wall um, constructed in the city between Iran and Turkey, is that, is that just decision between Iran and Turkey or uh, the other states? Uh, policies in the border regions. Depend on the international, yeah, international economy, the effects of international economy on the uh, local borders. Okay, I'm not sure to, to, to get the all part of the question, but I understood that it's about the war. <laughs> so I can give some clue. Um, about the, the the building of this wall on the Turkish Iranian border, uh, which is a decision made by Turkey uh, in two thousand seventeen, but also welcomed by Tehran by Iran, uh, especially because they um, they agree to curb uh, to curb illegal flows. Uh, which um, such as uh, illegal migration flows and uh, as I said also smuggling because smuggling is also considered as a source of income uh, for the PKK. So there, 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 there is this uh, common interest to curb the, the illegal flows. Uh, but the decision was made by Turkey in 2017, and uh, I made the I make the hypothesis in my thesis that uh, it was also um, the result of a, di a dynamic uh, the conflict in Syria, because as uh, Turkey started to intervene in northern Syria and to build a wall, it also created dynamic of securitization all the south the, the southern part of the border uh, in Turkey including the Iranian uh, border um, yeah so, I, I I don't know if I if I understand so the, if I uh, yeah I'm just 
industrial precisely the policy of capitalist economy on these regions, so uh, which uh, determines the policy of every single nation states, including Turkey and Iran as well. So uh, the border wall between Iran and Turkey founded by European Union as well. Mm. So this is the things, this is the um, very important things we need to think from very, very uh, big pictures. So not just the every single nation state policies and Syrian and Turkey border as well. Mm. So that's no, no. Yeah, of course, of course, the, the, the role of the European Union is very important in this matter, especially... So, so I want those who live in the Afghanistan and Iran yes, 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 to yes, go yes. to European continents. Mm. So mm. that's why the, the border wall is not the decision of the every single nation state, I think. And the, and the same issues is determined the Turkey and Syrian border as well. Mm. So the Arabic belt, and uh, that's not like ambitions of the nation states. Mm -hmm. And as you know, the international order always creates nation states by territorial borders. And uh, they have to have territorial borders and physical geographic elements. Uh, but at the same time, they have some policies to uh, keep their borders very secure. Mm -hmm. So that's the, I think, very important things. Uh, rather than the nation state policies. Mm. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I totally agree with you. And in my thesis, I've, I focused on different level uh, of motivation of the, this uh, wall uh, building, uh, which includes the security as well as a national interest in building this wall. And what is interesting, in my opinion, is how actors connect to uh, agree and, and welcome, if I may say, this uh, border policy, the securitization of border policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I agree with, uh, with that because, well, the situation was a bit different in Syria and Iraq and in, uh, in Iran, because as Joanna told you, in fact, in Iran, you have a formal uh, acceptation of, uh, of Iran. As the situation in, in uh, Syria and Iraq was a bit different because you have, uh, well, you have no state in front of uh, Turkey, but you have different actors. And the decision, of course, was taken formally by Turkey, but you have to integrate this decision in the migration uh, policy of the European Union, because at the same time when the decision was taken uh, of the war, of course, uh, the idea of Turkey was to secure its border, well, too, because you have, uh, especially at the beginning of the war, uh, the, 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 the border was very, became very flexible. So you have this idea to, to take again the control of the, the border. And you have especially we observed motives of the Turkish government in Turkey and in Syria and Iraq saying, well, we, we are taking uh, our border. This was a sort of nationalist posture of, uh, of Turkey. At the same time, if you observe, uh, the, it's the time when the, 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 the problem of migration came to, to Europe. And at that time, you have also in 2016, this agreement between Turkey and, uh, and the EU. And also, uh, at, at the same time of the agreement, uh, the EU advised Turkey especially to fix the migrant in Turkey or in, in, in Syria. So I, I think we have to, 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 to analyze the rules uh, regarding this uh, great issue of migration at the same time. Thank you. Thank you uh, also for this precision. Thank you, uh, Joanna. Uh, uh, time flies, I'm afraid. I mean, we are now 15 minutes uh, uh, ahead of the schedule. So, I mean, thank you very much uh, uh, to all the participants and thank you.
second line as well. Well, thank you. Richard, are you here? Yeah, hi, Daniel. How you doing? Hi, my dear. <laughs> Long time no see. Incredible. Yeah. Um, well, I hope I'll see you in Grenoble in late June. And uh, yes, know. sure, sure. I really hope. I really hope. I mean, I'm the other, I'm the other side of the Alps uh, in early June, so um, I don't know if I have to, come, have to come back home to London to get then get to you. I don't know, but uh, okay. Yeah. Great. I'll be in touch anyway. Thanks for taking part. Yeah, and I'm sorry. Sorry, I can. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, but, yeah. No, no, not a problem. I hope you will feel much better really soon.